perfect. What an evening we've had. And now we have the piece de resistance, as they call that, you know, um, a very special feature. Kimi Sugioka is our featured poet this evening. A well-regarded poet with a heartfelt voice, a soulful perspective, and she is a songwriter, an educator, and her voice is one that counters the current and historical, political, economic, and societal exploitation and subjugation of women and all oppressed people. She is informed by her experience as a bicultural mother, a public school teacher for which I endlessly praise you, having been in that field myself, I know what that can be like, the joys and not so joys. Mm. Also as a human being, a real person, a person of authenticity whose voice reaches from where she is in her heartfelt awareness and soulfulness to our heartfelt awareness and souls. She touches the essentials of what it is to be alive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so glad to see you all. Um, and I'm happy to have my son upstage me. <laughs> and, uh, I have one bad joke. How many elephants can you fit in a Volkswagen? Three in the front, back, two in the front, one in the glove compartment. This I thought was hysterical when I was like seven years old. I had the book 101 Elephant Jokes and I carried it with me everywhere. <laughs> it's like so bad. They're all so bad. Okay, so um, I'm starting out with a poem I wrote yesterday. Um, I'm in Clear Lake overlooking Clear Lake with this fantastic view. So this is about that. Morning above Clear Lake, autumn crisp, free from fear of fire. Flat green water vibrates with reflections of tule and scrub oak on Rattlesnake Island. Tiny ripples where cormorants, grebes, and ducks dive and sally forth. Great white egret suns on a dot post, purling his feathers in braggadocio. Osprey dives and clutches small bass, talons dug deep, carries it face forward, swimming into the wind. The woman turns her head westward, breasts and belly pointing skyward. She is the sleeping volcano, Kanakti. Sparrow, nuthatch, acorn, woodpecker, titmouse, ringneck dove scavenge the scrub oak or compete for seed. And except for the woman who yells at no one we can see, everybody sings. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and. This is a little bit about one of the parts of me. Scattered infinities. Who do I become each day after tripping over censure after censure? Stanchions of grief for beliefs held against or about me, judgments and admonishments that I should not, could not, disagree, argue, contradict, politely answering, rude questions, what are you, where do you come from, why are you here? The constant monitoring, adjusting, contriving, are they responding to me or their perception of someone they believe me to be? How do I interpret what isn't said but is implied, what is spoken that doesn't match what is meant? How do I get past these assumptions? mine and theirs. When I walk out the door, I leave behind my politics, my poetry, my rage, my authentic self like marbles on concrete, scattering infinities of self that roll into fissures, cracks, and potholes. I've done this for so long that I am not sure where or who they are. Thank you. Um, the 
poem I've never read before. I'm kind of weird. I really like to read new poems instead of old poems. Um, but this was about a visit to the mission Santa Barbara. In this moment, the sky of my being is a mosaic of impossible fragments coalescing in dirges, rising from the mission tile steps in grief and prayer for the enslavement and massacre of California's first people. When I visit the missions once every 20 years or so, I don't want to see the tamed and trimmed gardens, the dark, polished, heavy wooden altar, the cherubs and virgins. I want to see the stairs with their worn hollows and patina, where the ghosts of the people trod with paraffin and leather, cast iron and rope, so I can mourn their passage and celebrate their strength. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, and I want to read Autumnal Labyrinth, which is another sort of a new poem, pretty new poem. Minotaurs gallop through holes in the universe. La Llorona haunts hemispheres of longing for those who are gone, for those who are suffering, for those whose loneliness imprisons them. It is time to speak to the sea and remember the dead, their joys and sorrows and regrets, to reignite the myth of innocence, the nuthatch at the feeder, the dove on the Buddha, the plover hunkered in a footprint, the storm that washes shores and pavement with radiant and regenerative rain. How many labyrinth, labyrinths must be traversed to dismember the phantoms of accumulation and loss and place a spool of light in Persephone's hand to convince the dead to wake the living? Okay. And um, I want to read a poem I wrote from a prompt called We Held Out Our Hands. We held out our hands to catch the dew and rapture of morning, to hold the moon's round belly at night, to greet the hummingbird and finch, to caress the wind, we held out our hands to reach for a wilderness we have never known, to clutch the fables we have strung on beams of memory, to release a flock of restless thoughts. We held out our hands before we believed in dragonflies, before we knew that hands could take without giving. Thank you. I'm going to read um, a poem from my book called Stories. Stories unfurl like soiled blankets, the misfit child, the underdog janitor, the angry teacher, insinuated parables. I come home with groceries to a cold, dark condo bereft with the infestation of school district bureaucracies that disregard humanity and favor intransigent colleagues who believe that humiliation begets remorse. I feed the cats and rabbit, carefully minding their delicate digestive tracts, and eat Cheetos, olives, and cigarettes for dinner. The boys run. The boy runs and grins, will you chase me? Growls, pouts, punches the air and kicks the basketball pole, avoiding answers in addition and subtraction, an angry caricature, his voice a wildish whisper. The other children ignore, mimic, or misunderstand. An invisible man sweeps, mops, scrubs the feces from the bathroom stalls, walls, and floor where disgruntled employees prolifically shit in myopic protest of policies and practices over which he has no control. 
He listens acutely to tunes and news through earbuds while endlessly coughing the toxic dust of an unventilated post office warehouse. Weary and wearier, we walk the plank of self-censure, a vapor of elocution of grit and gravitas, a fragile mooring in a harbor of maelstrom, tired, targeted, imperfectly equipped to manage the slipstream, currents and eddies of our lone quests and missions. But when the teacher toggles the child and the child embraces the janitor, the stories become interlocked, the way a poem grasps and sometimes raptures and in moments is complete. Thank you. I'm trying to, yes, watch the time. Okay, uh, so I think I'm going to read two more poems and then sing a song to end. And the first one is called, I guess it's called Moonlight Meditation. It's a duplex that I've rewritten about 20 times. So we'll see how it goes this time. <laughs> the origin of moonlight is metaphor only when a mountain holds its breath. The mountain holds its breath in exquisite and sudden lava flows. Basalt, dacite, rhyolite, andesite foretell a millennia of volcanoes that do not wait for lullabies. Visceral eruptions catapult volcano lullabies into molten migrations of strangers. A shimmering migration of stranger rip, strangers ripples, methodically stolen tangential relations. Tangential relations mimic the ecliptic loneliness of intransigent celestial spheres. Celestial spheres mirror the transience of metaphor and progeny and the progeny of moonlight. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and the last poem I want to read for my song is called Lost Song Gazel. Another form, trying to push myself different directions. The unplayed guitar sits and stares sulkily. Effulgent evocations rippling rivers of possibility. I feel like a bird whose song is tangled in hubris. Ethereal realms in the breath between us. No notes dance into the deepening night. My throat guarded, locked and laced up tight. Jaws clench and ache for the resonance of song and a garland of smoked memories that tremble on time's spiral staircase winnows vestigial imaginings in illuminates of worn and weathered things. What is gated becomes inaccessible, invisible, and so I turn away from euphonious yearnings. So timbre and melody won't assault my ears with the passions I possessed in my younger years. <laughs> so that is sort of a poem to myself because I've been trying to get myself to play the guitar. Thank you so much for your attention. And, and so I figured I had to do that first and then play my song. <laughs> <laughs> which I, I hope I haven't sung here before. I don't think so. It is a song in call, called Invisible Heroes and Sacred Clowns about a man named Harry Smith. And I tried to look up a really brief description of Harry, who was a man I knew in his later years before he died. And it's almost impossible because he was a musicologist, an ethnomusicologist, a filmmaker, a mystic, a, I don't know. He did so many things. Um, he was 
famously accredited for um, collecting the songs that in um, a, a record collection called on American Folkways called um, American Folk Music, which according to lots of people, I guess, changed the direction of music in America, you know, in the 60s. So he was a very strange man, but um, hopefully you'll enjoy this song. He lived in a hotel of angels. You lived on the streets with your dreams. You lived in the town of golden boughs, a cynical, sublime refugee. High in the smoke of your cigarettes, with your books and your branches and gourds. You furnished your home with a log and a stone, scattered maple leaves on the floor. You wore a stained seer sucker jacket. Your pants were four sizes too huge. We offered you new clothes, but you said you preferred your simple suit of Dionysian hue. Now some may call you evil, and some may call you insane, but I will call you raven who stole a box of light and made day. You used to speak to the squirrel who lived in the trees above your house. You had an old wife who rose early and a young wife who rose late and you laughed when they bickered in the bows um. <laughs> um. and we asked you how you stopped drinking you said valium works pretty good for me you tried to kill the pain in your body and live off your mystic cosmogenies. And you kept squirrels and birds in your freezer and the varnished skeletons of mice. I guess I was shy, cause I never asked why you kept their little souls on ice. With your archaeologist scepter, your foil and cardboard crown, you looked like a fool, but your words were divine. Jess of a sacred clown. Last fall you were going to Egypt to make a film or dine with the Sphinx. But you finally said, if you weren't dead by then, you'd probably end up in Boulder instead. And you laughed when you spoke of your award. Said you crawled up on stage on all fours. 
bittersweet to receive such a commendation after food stamps and living door to door. And I told you I loved you in a letter, needing to say it just once. And you carefully said, I never read quite that far. The letter was just too long. Now some are invincible warriors, commanding cheers from the crowds. Some are invisible heroes, just a few are celestial clowns. Just a few are celestial clowns. Just a few are celestial clowns. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I do so appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Oh, you should see some of the comments over there. The wows, the oh my goodness is just wow. 